participants agree to the possibility of appearing on these recordings by virtue of attending. This virtual event was organized by uh, the uh, Committee on the Environment, Climate Change and Sustainability, CECCS, and is part of the Adams Sustainability Celebration, an event series celebrating successes, inspiring new activities, building relationships, and collaboratively deepening campus engagement around sustainability. This event was made possible by a generous donation by Wendy Adams. Um, I'm not sure, Wendy, if you're here, but uh, if so, uh, many thanks. There you are. Nice to see you here. Thanks for coming. I would like to read the uh, University of Toronto land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I'd like to say that I think that the land acknowledgement itself has some symbolic value, but I believe the true test is what it means to us and what action it leads to. I hope we can all reflect a bit on the historical and ongoing processes of colonization uh, that have taken place and are taking place here and the need for real change in how we act on the land and with Indigenous communities. With that, I will turn things over to uh, my co-chair, Ron Saporta, who will explain more about the competition. Thank you, John, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ron Saporta. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the University of Toronto, and also have the, the pleasure of being able to co-chair CECCS uh, with John. Uh, this is our third year uh, of the Innovation Prize competition, uh, which really features uh, students and startups right across our, our tri-campus competing for, for prizes in excess of $25,000. The goal of this competition is, is to find and support student sustainability ideas that could make a, a good big impact in the future. So thank you very much for attending today and for supporting this next generation of sustainability innovators. There'll also be an award presentation for the Adams Sustainability Faculty and Student Grant winners today, as well as our Sustainable Actions Award, which is awarded uh, tri-campus from our sustainability offices. But we certainly do have a lot to celebrate today. So I'd like to welcome everyone here, welcome our winners that are joining us today, as we've got a good full agenda for the next couple of hours. Just, just a, a few more of our housekeeping points. Um, you know, you can change the view for, from the speaker to the slides by, by using Zoom. Uh, we do have the chat feature enabled, uh, so feel free to, to discuss, to ask questions. Uh, but of course, we always want to ensure that that is done constructively and, and respectfully. So as such, any disruptive behavior is going to result in us having to remove people from the event so we can keep a good positive environment. So with that, I'd like to introduce our MC uh, for the day, uh, Derek Newton. Uh, Derek is our Assistant Vice President in Innovations, Partnerships and Entrepreneurship at the University of Toronto. He is a member of CECCS as well, and he's going to provide us a bit more about the competition structure, introduce our judges, and move on to the finalists. So over to you, Derek. Great. Thank you, Ron. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and to see such a great crowd supporting sustainability innovation at U of T. The University of Toronto Entrepreneurship Community is Canada's leading edge in leading engine for research-based startups and a global leader in transforming ideas into products, services that impact the world. In the past 10 years, more than 600 startups have been launched from U of T, outpacing every other Canadian university and generating more than $2 billion in investment. With expertise across diverse faculties, departments, and campuses, U of T's programs can be tailored to meet the needs of different kinds of entrepreneurs, from beginners in business to world-class researchers, social innovators, and more. This prize competition was an initiative of the President's Advisory Committee on the Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainability, and was tasked with finding ways to advance U of T's contributions to meet the challenges of climate change and sustainability, with a particular focus on research and innovation, teaching, and university operations. This annual competition offers over $25,000 in prizes to recognize, reward, and accelerate U of T's most sustainable ideas. Ideas may be more for market-ready products or for social innovation solutions. 
we have a tough job. And so we brought in six finalists. Uh, so six uh, teams will be compete today by showcasing their ideas via a brief pitch to a panel of judges. The top three winning teams will receive 10,000, 7,500 or $5,000 depending uh, uh, on, their, on their placement. And there are additional prizes of 1,000 each for each of the runners up. These teams have at least one founder who is a current U of T student, postdoc, or a recent alum. The competition is open to all faculties and sectors across all three campuses of U of T. If the team is a startup company, applicants must have received less than $25,000 in cumulative funding or investment and less than $25,000 of revenue. I'd like to take first take the opportunity to thank the seven faculty and six staff reviewers who had the difficult task to reviewing the first round of applicants to help us identify the six teams here today out of the 18 applicants to advance to today's pitch competition. I'd like now to welcome and introduce our esteemed panel of judges for today's competition who have the unenviable task of selecting the winners from a pool of six finalists. Yvette, Vera Perez is the team lead for MyTax Account Management Group. She directs a multidisciplinary group of accountant managers across Canada with a mandate of helping industry secure top talent and advance innovation. She has over 15 years of experience in clean tech and environmental technologies. Professor Ken Kortz is a microeconomics economist with research and teaching interests in industrial organization competition policy, organizational economics, and energy policy. He has published his research in leading academic journals. Professor Sarah Turkey L. Idrissi teaches courses at the University of Toronto Mississauga on the introduction of information systems and responsible innovation. Her research interests include green information technology, sustainability education, environmentally responsible behaviors, and artificial intelligence. Sue Talusin is a senior manager with the Mars Discovery District's Climate and Cities team. Sue works with community, government, and corporate partners to adopt innovative solutions to address their most pressing climate and urban challenges. She is co-chair of the Mars Sustainability Committee and also co-leads Creative Reuse Toronto. And last but not least, Professor Shiri Bresnitz is an economic geographer specializing in innovation, technology, and commercialization with a regional economic development. And now I'd like to introduce the finalists. We have Arbor, BioBlends, Lenti, Mealcare, Reaper, and the Yara C Youth Foundation. The finalists represent various disciplines and er areas showing the vast reach of sustainability across our community. A pre-recorded pitch for each finalist will be played followed by five minutes of questions by the judges. I will be the timekeeper and will flag when the five minutes is up. I wish all the finalists the best in the competition. And let's begin with Arbor. We don't hear the sound. No sound. Hello, everyone. We, we are Arbor. Arbor was born after I experienced a painful scalp sunburn, and I'm not alone in this suffering. Sunburns on the scalp are painful, and experiencing just one every two years can triple your risk of developing skin cancer. Yet 65% of women report that they do not enjoy wearing hats, even when it's sunny outside. But all sunscreen products are made to be a one-size-fits-all solution. They're all from the same brands, have the same smells, and that same greasy feeling to them. And those that contain harmful chemical sunscreen ingredients have been found to contribute up to 10% of coral reef bleaching worldwide, making them detrimental to life underwater. Our solution is a dry shampoo product with SPF for the scalp to provide optimal sun protection. Our product's proprietary formulation is specifically designed to absorb excess oils and provide nourishment to the hair. It contains mineral-based sunscreen ingredients that are reef safe and is also found in recyclable and sustainable packaging. With this in mind, our product addresses three of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. 
As women of color, we've identified that there's a gap in the market for products that are accessible and inclusive of women with all hair colors and types. And so our key product features were developed based on our extensive market research and testing on a diverse group of women. Our target market includes millennial and Gen Z women in Canada. We estimate that Arbor has a potential market size of $1.2 million based on our price of $25 per bottle and our market research. We have three main competitors in the powder sunscreen space. Generally, they are found in plastic packaging and are in, in the luxury pricing range, making them highly inaccessible to the average consumer. Or they are not formulated specifically to be used on the scalp and hair. Based on price and functionality, we are well positioned to provide the best sun protection product to our target customers. Over the last two years, we have been validating our idea through connecting with leading Canadian dermatologists and conducting market research with our target customers. Most recently, we have hired a formulation specialist and finalized our product formulation. Currently, we are conducting lab and clinical testing, which will be completed at the end of the month. Stephanie and I are the co-founders of Arbor, and we are both scientists by training. Through the development of our company, we've been backed by several subject matter experts in dermatology, the Health Canada regulatory space, and consumer package kits. We've also had the opportunity to partner with local and national organizations and incubators. We are passionate about educating our consumers on sun care and its many benefits for their long-term health, as well as providing them with an environmentally friendly option. We are currently preparing to submit our Health Canada application by the end of April. Once approved, we will begin manufacturing. Our ask is for $10,000 to put towards manufacturing our first 1,000 units of product. This funding will make a significant impact on our initial product launch and will help us get one step closer to disrupting the sunscreen industry. Thank you. Okay, great video, thank you. So now I'm going to ask uh, Christina, Stephanie, to turn your cameras on. And I'm gonna open the floor to our judges to ask questions and I'll try to moderate this. And of course the timer is starting for five minutes and maybe judges, you can just raise your, your hand or jump right in with a question. All right, Shuri. Hi, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you have uh, done any uh, research regarding to intellectual property. Have you submitted any patents applications? Um, at the moment, we haven't submit, submitted any patent applications. Um, we're using uh, active ingredients, um, mineral active ingredients that are um, already used in sunscreen and, um, and very commonly used. Um, however, we do have a proprietary um, formulation. Okay, I see Yvette's got her hand up. Um, thanks, everyone. Really good presentation uh, to the team. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you spoke about different um, um, other brands, other um, dry shampoos out there. My question is more, so how does yours differ from the existing ones in terms of uh, sustainability and environmentally uh, friendly um, characteristics? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, compared to our competitors, our packaging is uh, sustainable, comes, it can be recyclable or decompostable. Um, and we're using mineral-based ingredients as well, which um, are safe for coral reefs. A lot of people don't know that traditional uh, chemical sunscreen ingredients, they contribute up to 10% of coral reef bleaching worldwide um, and are highly detrimental to life underwater. So that would be our differentiator. Great, thank you. And Sarah's got her hand up. Yes, hi. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Very nice and uh, very well said. So um, my question is about the ingredients. You talked about mineral ingredients that they are not um, that they are safe for the um, environment. But did you look at um, the impact on human health? Because we know that some mineral components that already exist in sunscreens, they can they have been uh, tested to lead to cancer in some cases. Did you check this possibility? in the mineral ingredients you are using and which ones are they? 
Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the mineral ingredients that we're using are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, and they've already been extensively researched and used in a lot of other industries aside from cosmetics. So they're also found in plastics, um, food, and other um, types of like industrial materials. Um, I think the research that's been found about uh, the impact of um, sunscreen on human health has been traditionally on the uh, chemical sunscreen ingredients, actually. So ones like avobenzone and oxybenzone, those ones have been found to be hormone disruptors in animals and are currently warranting further, um, further research on their impact for human health. But uh, the ones that we're using, um, we did not specifically test for toxicity because they're already approved by Health Canada, but we haven't seen any research to, um, to link uh, poor human health uh, to those ingredients specifically. Great, thank you. And Ken, you're on mute, Ken. How long have we been at this? A while. I was gonna ask about whether you've explored any um, partnerships that might help you achieve visibility in the market or distribution. Uh, and I was thinking about, you know, it could be healthcare related, um, you know, interest groups, NGOs and so on, or maybe ocean, uh, ocean, uh, reef preservation kind of uh, NGOs or something like that, but any kind of allied, um, any partnerships with any kind of allied organizations that might help you raise the profile or raise, uh, gain distribution? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at the moment, we've been um, exploring um, more local companies, um, so such as like uh, natural health food stores um, in particular. Um, we've been in conversation with Nutrition House um, to potentially list our product on um, their online um, uh, as a, become a vendor on their online platform and have access to um, their client base. Um, and outside of the um, more local uh, partnerships that we've been looking at, um, we have been uh, approached previously by some like larger companies um, who may be interested in partnering us um, further down the line um, as we get closer to the, our launch. That's great. Well, what a great pitch and thank you for this. We are at our five minute mark. So Christina, Stephanie, thank you so much. Next up is BioBlends. So we'll play the video and then we'll get to the Q&A. Hi there, my name is Juan Lamilla and today I am excited to introduce to you BioBlends Diesel Solutions. Let's get started. Now the problem, fuel prices have risen steadily since Stats Canada have tracked them. This especially hurts our target market, Alberta farms, which run almost entirely on diesel. Furthermore, as general concern for climate change increases, individuals and businesses are looking for ways to reduce environmental impact without necessarily decreasing revenue. In fact, 87% of Canadian farmers say they're motivated by their own personal views to improve environmental quality. Lastly, there's a lack of options. Canadian farmers want to reduce their environmental footprint, but with already tight margins and the cost of fueling their vehicles increasing, they don't have any, any economically viable alternatives. This is where we come in. By recycling waste cooking oils from local restaurants and waste diesels from local truck stops and gas stations, we create usable biofuels and biodiesel that work in any standard compression ignition or diesel engine. These are renewable fuels that work in the farmer's existing equipment. No need for expensive new machinery. By connecting members to small communities, BioBlends is the intermediary step for converting the restaurant's wastes into their neighboring farmer's fuels empowering businesses to recycle locally, reaping the benefits inside their own counties. Of course, the big talking point regarding fuel is price. Here's some data we've recorded over the past few months of gas stations farmers regularly use around Edmonton. Notice that red line well below all the others? That's us. Our pricing may sound too good to be true, but we're able to do it by recycling used products and having two sources of revenue, selling the diesel and the waste collection. These visuals show our revenues alongside miscellaneous expenses, all for a single liter of fuel from pickup to processing to drop off. Now onto traction, we do have a viable product ready with testing, supply and pricing secure. We're actually only one of five registered renewable fuel producers in Alberta, only one of three that's registered to produce biodiesel and the only one with intent to sell it back to Albertans. Now onto the team, aligned with our respective backgrounds, I handle the business and marketing aspects of BioBlends while Patrick, who has been making and experimenting on biodiesel to fuel his family's farm since he was just a kid, 
runs the creation and production aspects of the biofuels. Having grown up on, Al on Albertan farms surrounded by the breathtaking Rockies and the vast expanse of the prairies, we understand the unique challenges faced by everyday Albertan farmers and want to do our part to help protect the environment we know and love. As a company, we've essentially started from scratch, building our processing plant ourselves using whatever materials we could find around our farms. This has given us the advantage of having a deep understanding of the science and logistics. However, it does mean our costs are significantly higher than what they should be due to inefficiencies in our handmade systems. We've had farmers come to us asking to buy our fuel right away. Unfortunately, we just don't have the production capabilities to meet demand. So our next steps are focused on increasing production to reach our sales goals. That's it for me. Thank you for listening. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Juan. Great pitch. And I think you're here with your co-founder, Patrick, who could also join for the Q&A. And yes. I'm, going, I'm going to start the timer and open the floor to the, for the panelists, to the, to the judges. Sue, over to you. Thanks uh, for the great pitch. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, diesel and biodiesel. I actually drive a diesel car and used uh, biodiesel here in Toronto for a short period of time. Um, I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit more about the sustainability impact beyond just the use on farms. Um, if you mentioned that the biodiesel would be generated from collection from restaurants and, and I would assume larger communities. So thinking about how you're gonna get it from there to the farms for use, if you've accounted for that in your life cycle assessment model of the product. Uh, yes, that's something we have to consider very carefully, uh, especially for the sustainability aspect of collecting our supplies. That's one of our uh, biggest focus. Um, so when we enter a market, when we chose to begin in Edmonton, the area surrounding Edmonton, we were looking very carefully at who are the, the local suppliers, who are the restaurants we could collect from, what would it take for us to be able to pick up their, their oils, what would it take for us to clean it and process it, and then in the end, convert it into something that can be used later on. So it's very important for us to look at the entire aspect of production when we see the environmental impact of the, the final result. Great. Shuri has got her hand up and then Yvette. Well, I'm repeating myself, but um... Do you have um, any information regarding competitors and any backgrounds regarding the protection of the intellectual property? Yes. So our competitors currently, there's a, there's a big focus on, for example, collecting a lot of clean oils from, say, canola farmers and then transporting it over to Europe. That's essentially what most uh, large biodiesel production farmers uh, farms are doing. Uh, and I think there's a big market that's missing specifically here in Canada. There's almost this forgotten market. Now, our, I think our magic really comes from our ability to find these small communities and find these self-sustaining small communities where they have these restaurants that could be fueling you know, directly the farmers that are eating at their tables, but they're not seeing this, this opportunity. And so we're bringing it to them. We're talking with these restaurants, these local partners. We're saying, hey, these farmers that are coming straight through your doors, you could be fueling them. And they're already providing you with the oil. So why can't we create this circular cycle in this area? And furthermore, we also have to create our own proprietary blends of the biodiesel to ensure that it works all year round since Alberta can get very cold. So that's why that's where the bio blends come from. We're making our own blends of biodiesel. Thank you. Great, thank you. And over to Yvette. Um, thanks, uh, Derek. Thanks, uh, Juan. This is really interesting. Um, a uh, long time ago, I used to work in the biofuel space. It's a very tight, uh, the economics uh, of biofuels uh, productions is really tight. So I wonder in your first market, perhaps, uh, is, there, um, is there a radius in kilometers that, uh, that makes sense for you to, uh, to, to look into those uh, collections? And uh, as a follow-up, um, I'm wondering about break-even. So, so, so what are the volumes that you need to be able to collect to make uh, the, uh, the plant, uh, the biodiesel plant uh, viable? And um, so those are the volume, the, the feedstock in. And then what is the, uh, what are the numbers of tons per day or kilograms per day that you would be looking to produce to again, make the whole um, business viable economically? 
Uh, that's a great question. So one of the advantages of working with biodiesel production specifically is that the process is relatively simple. And so we're able to, to scale up or scale down depending on the size of the market that we're trying to enter uh, without losing too many costs or gaining too, yeah, essentially uh, expanding the costs. So at the moment we are entering the Edmonton market and entering the, the small county surrounding Edmonton, looking at each county directly to see, okay, these are the restaurants nearby. This is how far outside of the county we could economically send the fuel to these farms directly. And so by going county by county, we ensure that there's a sustainable product here that the farmers could use. If we find a county that maybe doesn't have as many restaurants, unfortunately, we might have to pass up. But that also gives us the, by working with biodiesel also gives us the opportunity of not just working with farms. It also allows us to work with construction companies if we want to expand in that market, if we want to find uh, more opportunities there. Now, when it comes to the amount of fuel that we need to produce to be uh, profitable, that also depends on the market that we're entering. So right now, as I said, we're focusing on Edmonton. We're specifically starting off in the east side of Edmonton near our Drossom and Sherwood Park, if anybody knows where that is. Uh, this is a very strong spot because there's a hub for a lot of, of a lot of restaurants in this area. It's a very economically powerful part for people who are all around Edmonton to come into there and enjoy the focus there. And so we find that there's a large amount of supply. And there's at the moment more supply than we need to, to fuel that farms, but it, that, that really depends on which area we're entering into. Great, thank you. We're, we're at time, but Sarah has patiently had her hand up. So maybe uh, let's go for one quick question and we'll go okay. for a quick answer. <laughs> Just a quick question. You mentioned that it's more expensive. Your product is more expensive than competition. So do, how are you gonna uh, solve this challenge? Our product is actually less expensive at the oh, moment than our you competition. You mentioned something, okay. Something Did I, I about... might have misspoken. All right, okay, then it's okay, it's good. Yeah, no, we're, uh, one of the advantages of working with biodiesel is we're not currently as strongly affected by uh, the diesel market, anything that might affect the diesel market. For example, the recent situation in Ukraine has affected diesel prices tremendously. And our supplies aren't affected as much by that situation. And so we're able to price lower. We're able to price a bit more independently from that market. And as far as we've tracked, and we've been tracking for quite a few months, we're able to price well below the rest of the diesel market to remain competitive. Okay, thank you. That's great. Well, the market is certainly um, some good market conditions for you, Juan and Patrick. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Now we're going to hear from Lente. So we'll cue the video now. Any truly sustainable sneakers, so I'm not prepared for that answer. Um, not sure off the top of my head. I know that. Lenti is a novel sustainable fashion marketplace. It aggregates sustainable certified brands and their clothes for our target audience, consumers ages 18 to 35. Initially, we will offer 16 Canadian B Corp certified brands, as this is the gold standard for environmental and social fashion responsibility. From these certified brands, users can browse clothing items through two categories, the brand itself or the clothing type. To demonstrate this, we'll take you through a user search for a sweater. Starting in the shop by category, users can filter clothing products to browse sweaters from a variety of sustainable brands. After selecting a sweater, they'll arrive at the product page, which includes the brand price, sustainability certification, and similar clothing items. Users can then be redirected to the brand's own checkout page to purchase the sweater, or they can add the item to their wish list and continue shopping. 
overall, Lindy ensures that consumers have a platform to access slow fashion brands. But this marketplace has a foundation for growth. First, Lenti will expand to include 29 US and 6 UK B Corp brands, in addition to including brands under 43 sustainable fashion certifications. Service-wise, the interface will be improved, allowing users to purchase items through our marketplace directly and an app will be developed. We will also build a community through releasing sustainable digest issues and offering an exclusive proprietary brand. From this growth, Lenti will operate under a diversified revenue stream, pay what you can donations, portion of sales, and ad-based revenues. To reach this point, however, Lenti requires funding. Capital will be allocated to website operation, design, and developmental costs, and digital marketing using cost-effective Instagram and TikTok. To bring this marketplace to life, a team of five University of Toronto graduate students from diverse backgrounds will be the leaders of Lenti. We welcome you to join us on our slow and sustainable fashion journey. Thank you. Wonderful, great video. And so I think we have Elise, Alana, Angelica, Laura, and she here tonight, today. So we'll put your cameras on and over to the judges for questions. Ken has his hand up first. Hey, um, great presentation. I just wanted to ask, I've had a, a, a lot of students do projects on sustainable clothing. And uh, one thing that always comes up is that you know, it's great to have the clothing itself be manufactured in a way according to sustainability principles and all of that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's really about the life cycle of the garment. And uh, if you're just buying sustainable clothing, but it ends up in the landfill on a short cycle, that's not in the broader scheme of things that's sustainable. So just wondering if you have any anything to, to say or any part of your business model that speaks to that more um, full life cycle um, aspect of the apparel industry sustainability challenges. Yeah, um, as we're a slightly larger group, I'm going to be moderating the questions, but I can take that one. So we find that our solution answers to the first part of the fashion crisis. We find that there's obviously the landfill part when clothes get thrown away, um, they end up in landfill, and that's obviously a huge problem. But on the other side of things, in production, there's huge issues with pollution and local communities being contaminated by toxic substances and kids getting ill in places like Bangladesh and China. And we're trying to tackle the side of there, we're in production and really encourage consumers to shop sustainably. And then in the future, when we look to scale up our business, we want to try and tackle the waste issue and look at things like having hiring clothes and answering to people that are throwing away clothes that might maybe end up in clothing markets in say Ghana, there's a huge textile resale industry there. So it's something we've considered and it's definitely something we want to look at in the future, but for now we're trying to help like bring back the pollution side of fashion. Great, thanks. And Sue has a question. Thank you for the, the presentation. I have actually two questions, one which is a bit of a follow on from uh, Kenneth's question around potentially shifting your business model. And I've been doing a lot of work recently internationally with people like doing studies and thinking about what our lifestyle is going to need to look like in say five to 10 years and, and just being able to, you know, make specific choices, purchase less clothes and so on. And I'm wondering if you've considered like, you know, shifting, you know, whether it's being able to return items in a way where people can have an extended you know life to a garment or like supporting things like mending so I get a little bit more digging into your business model um, in that regard um, and then the other piece i'm wondering if you can address is around how people will actually find you and i think your initial point was around you know people don't know where to find sustainable companies so what about you know your marketing plan and your communication strategy will make it different so you know it's great that it's being aggregated in one place but how are people still going to find you in a way that's different um, to get over that barrier where people can't you know find companies today yeah definitely I think we discussed um, as a team and as a business I can touch on the first question just talking about the waste we definitely as we said we recognize that waste is a huge problem um, and first, we want to grow our business and really invest in attracting people to Lenti and making sure they understand sustainable fashion. And then once we've harnessed enough users, we can start to have a blog and inform them um, and really 
educate people about the business and then hopefully use funding that we have and future investment to look at the waste side of things. Um, in terms of how we're looking to market it and expand it, um, Elise will answer that for us. Yeah, thank you, Laura. So I think with marketing, we kind of looked at how are we going to build our first 100 users and us ourselves, the team, we're from the Masters of Science and Sustainability Management. So we're kind of from a cohort that really does like, and we kind of echo each other's thoughts. So we thought, well, we're going to start there and we're going to build our business there. And we have multiple colleagues also within the fashion industry um, in our program as well. So we start with marketing there and we're using Instagram and TikTok and we have a marketing strategy and specifically have allocated costs to that marketing strategy. Um, our plan was then to further expand and use nano influencers, specifically sustainable nano influencers um, as sort of brand ambassadors, build a community um, and slowly and slowly use that community to build further and further growth. Um, because we have identified that this is, this is a huge gap in knowledge and people are actively seeking it. When we talk to people about the idea, they're like, oh, I, yeah, I, I never knew that existed. I, 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 this is something I look for. So um, we're hoping starting with our own community and then building out is our key. Great, thank you. And time for one more question. One of our judges has... Your presentation was excellent then. Thank you very much to the entire Lenti team. Great video, great presentation, thank you. Okay, our next team is meal care. So we will cue the video. How crazy would this scenario be? Imagine 5 million people. That's more than all the people in Toronto and Montreal combined. And they're all food insecure. Imagine them on one side here. But on the other side, imagine a massive mountain of 6 billion pounds of good edible food. But here's the catch. These people, they're not allowed to eat it or access it at all. Instead, it just rots and goes to waste. I wish this was a fictional scenario, but this is happening in Canada today. The 5 million people are the 1 in 7 Canadians who are food insecure. And the 6 billion pounds of food, that's how much goes to waste every year in just the grocery retail and food service industries in Canada. That doesn't include household waste or other waste in the supply chain. This is ridiculous, and meal care is making a difference to improve the situation. Meal care diverts surplus food from food vendors such as cafeterias, restaurants, grocery stores, and delivers it to people in need. But we don't stop there. Mealcare also works to tackle the root issue of food waste by trying to help vendors to reduce the amount that they throw out in the first place through analytics. But before we tell you how it's done, I'd love to introduce part of the team. My name is Milton, and you can see Santa here too. We co-founded Mealcare and have expanded to multiple cities in Canada. You can also see Tamara and Anna here. They are the two incredible leaders creating Mealcare at U of T. Mealcare works in a simple yet effective way. First, food is set aside by food vendors, and data is recorded by volunteers. Then, the food is transported by volunteers to the food aid organizations, such as a homeless shelter. The food is received and saved. And finally, we share the food waste data back to the donating food vendor. This simple model is exactly what sets us apart. Sometimes innovation is about making things simple. We don't need to own warehouses, trucks, or have tons of employees. Instead, we leverage the community to collaborate and achieve our results. We are a lean, sustainable, and easily scalable operation. Plus, we're the only organization that helps decrease the amount of food waste generated. This model works. We have delivered over 50,000 meals to people in need, diverting it from going to waste. This is worth $250,000 to our partners, such as homeless shelters. We have operations in eight cities, five of which have formed in the past six months. But we have ambitions to do so much more. The prize money from this award could allow us to support our current chapters, especially through developing the analytic solution for food vendors. But also, this money can make it possible for us to reach our goal of doubling the cities Mealcare operates in to 16 and diverting 100,000 pounds total by September of next year. Thank you for joining us in creating a more sustainable food system. Wonderful. So if the team from Me Meal Care could put their videos on and over to the judges. Yvette. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Derek. And, and, and thank you to the team. This is, uh, yes, a uh, very important uh, issue to address. Uh, my question is, uh, can you tell, you hinted at it, I, I, I think, but can you tell me how you differentiate yourselves from, uh, say, companies like Second Harvest and, um, and a little bit about the economics of, um, of, of, of what you need to make uh, meal care uh, viable? Yeah, of course. So Second Harvest is like a very great organization based in Toronto. And we actually had a conversation with them when we were starting meal care, just to see where the gaps are. And for based on that conversation, they mentioned like small, medium scale um, food donors, such as grocery stores, catering companies, even university cafeterias was an area that they couldn't focus on, um, as well as like giving back this data, which is kind of two areas that we try to really focus our value on. Um, and so based on our conversation, we created meal care, which is very scalable in comparison to very large food donors like uh, Second Harvest, um, as well as focusing on these small players, just because logistically it's quite difficult for them to focus on them versus like a very large organization like Costco. So that became kind of the validation behind meal care. And then in terms of the second question, it's really like a very low cost startup um, expense for us. It's literally as yeah, even Anna and Tamara could mention just because they started quite recently, um, the only expense would be containers to distribute the excess food, um, maybe a little bit of equipment uh, just to off, offset any gas expenses. But other than that, that would be, that would be it. And that's why we've been able to start and expand so quickly, um, even though we don't have that much funding. I guess the only like the innovation aspect, which is something we're currently working on beyond just making it very scalable um, and the infrastructure would be like the food waste analytics. Right now, at McGill, for instance, in Montreal, we just sent like the data, the raw data. Sorry, did I cut off? Um, we send the raw data back to uh, the university when we want to eventually start making kind of analytics that could inspire and reduce long-term food waste. Great. I'm sure he has her hand up. Sorry, still forgetting that. Um, so I really good presentation and uh, important um, avenue of work. So this is going to be a not-for-profit. So you're gonna be based on donation mostly? So as of now, all our impact, like our 50,000 meals has been purely through like grant funding, um, which has been very obviously minimal just to qualify for this thing. And like very small donations by our like donors, like our grocery stores, our catering companies and our cafeterias. And I would say long-term, it's really potentially gaining revenue through the data analytics. Right now we get very small donations just because of the, how helpful it is, but long-term with like this prize money and our current um, like analytics play, it would be providing very intelligent insights to these like grocery stores, catering companies based on long-term data, which we have been collecting for the past like four years for, from some of our donors, where we could say like in the month of July, you should reduce the amount of chicken you produce by X percent or the amount of vegetables you produce on this day because like there's a no in the like displacement of individuals. So that would be like the long-term play. And once again, all the money would be funneled back into the organization. It is like a social enterprise, a non-for-profit. I don't think um, at least the founders or uh, we don't plan on monetizing it except just to pay for like employees and such. Great. And three more judges have their hands up. So uh, this is great. I'm going to go to Sue and then Sarah and then Ken, if I think I've got the order right. Over to you, Sue. Thank you for the, the presentation. This is fascinating. And I think the topic goes quite broadly into other, uh, I would say, systemic issues that we face in society. So uh, I'm, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about the data analytics piece and sort of the long-term growth potential for the company. Because I uh, essentially see you as like putting yourselves out of business around the food movement part and how that's going to impact maybe the social sector where they're actually dependent on the food. So I see that there's a huge viability for you in the growth around, you know, the business side um, for the data analytics and maybe targeting other companies that currently aren't your, you know, your market where you're actually getting food from. So I'm just curious if your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, no, I love that question. Jeff, that means you understand the model. So like some people think you're cannibalizing your own like customers, but for us, like there's been so many players like Second Harvest that just simply donate the food, but the same issue like occurs. Like we're, we're wasting $49.5 billion with the food each year like, in Canada, which is like a relatively like smaller country in comparison to, to the US. So like our idea would be, you know, there is a huge amount of problem, a huge amount of waste. So we want to reduce the amount of food that's that's generated by providing this analytics and then target other potential small medium grocery stores that exist within the city. So like here, I'm in Toronto right now, there's like four grocery stores I could see outside my window that are small and not, um, that could be potential customers. And once one is addressed, we just move on to the other. Great, thank you. And we're almost at time, we're at time. So we're gonna go very quickly uh, to Sarah, Ken, and I'll ask the team for short answers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question was about the volunteers. So you're gonna base like your, your business model is on uh, like um, focuses on volunteers and their help. So what if you don't find volunteers or you get stuck with food and you don't have any volunteer to send it out? Do you have any information system to help you track that activity? The other part of my question is about the quality of the food as well. Do you have any IS system that helps you uh, track the quality of the food before getting any food poisoning or something and distributing the food? Yeah. So for the volunteers, we usually set up like an infrastructure before actually taking donations. So like on this call, we have Anna tomorrow who are starting the chapter in Toronto alongside other like volunteers who are all students. And once they've established like this core team, as well as like a, a cohort of volunteers beyond themselves, then um, they'll partner with like U of T cafeterias, which is one of their current partners right now to start that like infrastructure of donations. Um, so at any time, there's always a volunteer to, to receive and do the donation. Um, second part. And that was a question relating to, oh yeah, food, food check. So it, the food is checked twice, at least. One by the, the donor, so like the university cafeteria chef or the restaurant chef, as well as the chef at the homeless shelter. So we do follow like the Good Samaritan Act, which protects meal care from the distribution of food. Um, but we do ensure that the food is safe and healthy upon consumption by our community. Ken, did you still have a question? My question got covered along the way in the other question. Okay. okay, thank you to the meal care team. Wonderful. Up next is Reaper. So we will cue that video. I'm Dr. Jonathan Edwards. At Reaper Technologies, we make pristine materials from dirty plastics. In 2019, 353 million tons of plastic waste was generated worldwide. This means that the average person generated their body weight in plastic waste. 87% of Canadian plastics end up in landfills or in waterways. Plastics can take hundreds of years to degrade and they release harmful microplastics as they break down. Unfortunately, a small fraction of plastics which are recycled are typically downcycled into lower quality applications. Fossil fuels are then used to derive new plastics for the original, higher quality application. At Reaper Technologies, we harness the intrinsic value of plastic waste and create high quality recycled materials. To do so, used plastics are first incinerated, extracting their embedded energy and carbon. Then, using electricity, CO2 building blocks are combined into ethylene. Ethylene is the precursor to polyethylene, the world's most common plastic. Post-consumer plastic waste is often contaminated with small amounts of organic content, mixtures of materials, or thin plastic films. Contaminated waste is usually landfill since it cannot be processed by conventional facilities. Being able to operate on contaminated feedstocks, our technology can handle more post-consumer plastic streams. The plastic precursors generated by our technology are chemically identical to those derived from fossil fuels. Our recycled materials can be utilized more broadly than conventional recyclables, and in any application, the virgin material is used. Our technology generates revenue from two sources. 
municipalities and other waste management facilities pay a disposal fee to accept their waste. The plastic precursors generated by our process will be resold to polyethylene consumers. Both of these revenue sources represent significant global markets and CO2 emitters. Per kilogram of virgin ethylene produced, there are three kilograms of CO2 equivalent emitted during the manufacturing and three at the end of life. When powered with renewable electricity, the carbon footprint of our process can be as low as 0.3 kilograms per life cycle, an order of magnitude less. CO2 electrolysis is the enabling technology underpinning this exciting solution. Over the past five years, I have developed tremendous expertise and IP in this important field. As a finalist in the NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize, I designed and operated the world's largest CO2 to ethylene electrolyzer system. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. And Jonathan, I know you're here with us today, so you'll put your camera on and I'll open it to the judges. Yvette, over to you. Thanks, Derek. Uh, yeah, fantastic, Jonathan. This is really interesting. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the, uh, the, the it, CO2 electrolysis. Is, 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 is the process, how energy intensive is it? And uh, what are the, uh, the, the key bottlenecks, if you will, to make uh, this process viable um, at this point in time? Yeah, so um, it does use a fair amount of electricity. Um, it's best run with renewable electricity. And um, right now, I would say the biggest challenge is that there's not a lot of large scale demonstrations of it. And so the real, it's really exciting. It's been demonstrated on the lab scale, but there's not been a whole lot of bigger demonstrations. And so just uh, showing how it can scale up and that it can work at bigger scales is a big step forward. And, something that's really needed right now. Great. Other judges, the question or? Over to you, Sherry. Thank you for your presentation, Jonathan. I wanted to ask uh, about your team. Is it? Just you or there are other people involved? Right now it's just me. So who does all the business side of, you know, the finance, the growth, the market growth analysis? Yeah, it's, it certainly would have to grow. Right now it's sort of just, the team is just myself, but it would have to certainly expand more people. Thank you. All right, Ken, over to you. I was headed in a similar direction, which is asking kind of what stage of this uh, you're at. Um, do you have lab demonstration? Do you have a larger pilot demonstration? How close are you to piloting it with commercial customers? Just kind of where are you in that progression from lab to commercialization? Yeah, so um, like I said, the important part of this whole sort of loop is the CO2 electrolysis. And so I myself, I did my graduate, my PhD in that area. And so now <clears throat> I was really excited by that technology and what it can do. So the first step was sort of for me to really understand it and understand that field and what can happen. And so now the next step is to sort of look at coupling that with other related technologies. And so the next step is to sort of look at, okay, exactly what would this sort of integrated system look like at a more like economic and environmental level? Um, how the different subsystems would interact and sort of some more modeling, some more understanding of uh, the real benefits of this approach. And it sounds like some of that might require a partnership with uh, firms with other expertise in the complementary technologies to really continue to the next phase of that um, processing. Is that right? Yeah. So, for example, it would require expertise with people who are familiar with sort of the waste incineration and then sort of also on the other side of things, the downstream uh, like processing of the, the products of CO2 electrolysis into a saleable product. And so there's a few different 
um, elements would have to be integrated there. Um, yeah. Okay, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm not very familiar with your field, but I am just trying to understand, like, do you need a big facility to start doing this uh, production on a larger scale? So maybe you need a partnership with some utility production places or the city. Did you think about all this, how you're gonna start your production? So it's gonna be market, I mean, profitable for you. Yeah, so that's a really great point. And the beauty of like the CO2 electrolysis is that it's very scalable. Um, if you want more conversion, um, in other words, like more plastic conversion, uh, then you're gonna put more stacks or more cells. And if you want less, you can just uh, sort of install less. So it's very scalable up and down. So I, I sort of envisioned there would be a sort of small scale demonstration, and then we could use the same core technology and build it up to a pilot scale and so on and so forth. But it, the CO2 electrolysis can scale down quite nicely to smaller scales. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Oh, we also, I'm sorry, we, Sue has a question. Uh, at the buzzer, go ahead. Sue. If we if we have time for just a, a, yeah. a couple a couple more seconds, uh, just thinking about some interesting pilots that are happening in the city of Toronto um, in the solid waste management area, um, for example, with renewable natural gas from the organics collection. And I'm wondering if you've thought of something similar. Um, and you didn't really talk too much about the components that come from the process um, that you you know you're talking about if things related to emissions or byproducts um, that potentially have other you know. I guess, viability for this model to help fund it or uh, that wouldn't be just considered waste. So, sorry, you're saying, can we act like, is there other benefits beyond just CO2 um, management? Yeah, I, I guess I'm wondering like what what's actually coming out of the process. So you talked about it's energy intensive, but the actual, you know, the byproducts of, of the process that you're doing, are they all going to waste? Is it something that can become a circular process? And I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about how it works. Yeah, so the the idea is the incineration, any sort of pollutants from that would be captured. And then from the CO2 electrolysis, there will be some um, byproducts, but a lot of them can be fed internally. For example, one byproduct can be used to help improve combustion in the incineration step. And so there's... Um, and the other byproducts hopefully can be minimized and kept to uh, uh, converted into more uh, raw material, but there will be some um, byproducts, small amounts. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, and now, last but not least, we have the YRC Youth Foundation. of the USC Youth Foundation, or YSYF. We are a startup NGO led by students in interdisciplinary programs, and we work to support the economic and health development of young women in Ghana. Uncontrollable plastic pollution is a significant problem in Ghana. Three million tons of plastic is imported, but only 5% is recycled. The rest accumulates in the environment, causing fatal floods by clogging drains. About 18% of this plastic waste comes from bags and food packaging. And in 2021, the Ghana government called on citizens to reduce plastic consumption. In addition, many communities in Ghana face socioeconomic challenges. Our NGO works in the rural community of Doryumi, where there is a lack of meaningful employment. This disproportionately affects women and girls, resulting in food insecurity and high rates of adolescent pregnancy. Thus, there is a need for a strong, locally produced alternative to plastic that is sustainable, affordable, and supports the economic development of young women. As a solution, we propose the banana fiber bag, a biodegradable, reusable paper bag made from the stems and leaves of locally grown plantain and banana plants, which are waste products of food production. Studies have shown that banana fiber paper is actually lighter, stronger, and more water and flame resistant than regular paper, making it advantageous to use as a shopping bag. Two versions of the banana fiber bag will be developed and sold. One will be a shopping bag for general consumers, sold at 60 cents, and the other a branded gift bag sold to institutions for $2.
our target customers are personas who value ethically sourced, sustainable products. Our primary beneficiaries will be young women who we will hire and train to manufacture these bags. Through our project, we will target the SDGs 5, 10, 8, and 12, which seek to reduce global gender inequalities and increase responsible consumption. To date, we've received $18,000 in funding from the Adams Prize and the McMaster World Challenges Challenge. This has allowed us to create a prototype, order custom production machinery, begin constructing a workshop, and even secure one acre of farmland. We've also secured a pre-order support letter from Divine Lilies Hospital and are connecting with businesses in Ghana for additional ones. Funds from this prize will be used to cover long-term investments, including completing the construction of our workshop, purchasing tools, and launching a marketing campaign to drive demand. This idea has tremendous growth potential as plantains are widely available and production requires very limited training. In five years, we hope to set up satellite businesses across Ghana, led by the young women we train at our site. Finally, this project is scalable to many low-income communities in Asia and South America, where bananas are also produced. Funding this project could therefore create an avenue for environmental protection and social development on a global scale. Thank you. Great, great presentation. All right, so if the uh, REC Youth Foundation team could turn their cameras on and we're gonna open the floor to questions. And Ken is up first. I guess I said a, a, a great presentation. I had a question kind of to clarify in my mind what the scale of this looks like, thinking about how um, the raw materials the, and the labor uh, and the workshop all kind of come together at what scale and to kind of to, to finance that and make it viable, how big a um, how, kind of how big a market do you need and, and kind of what's the scale of buyer you're talking about? So this pre-order letter, like what fraction of an efficient scale operation would that support and how many um, buyers like that would you need to make it hold together and to run a scale like that, you know, how many, um, how many workers would that keep employed? And so I'm just trying to kind of imagine what the scale of this is and what that looks like relative to the, to the uh, possibilities in the community that you're dealing with. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, from our two-year pro profit projection that we've done, what we've been able to estimate is that we'd be able to produce 5,000 bags in one year, and that would require producing 5,000 yards of fiber. Um, the potential market is enormous. So there are 2.6 million people in the greater Accra area who would be potential consumers that could purchase the bag. And we also have 48,000 businesses in Ghana who are also potential consumers. Um, so within the course of a two-year um, profit projection plan, what we've seen is a 35% profit margin in the first year. And that's based on being able to produce those 5,000 units. And then in the second year, being able to scale up production to 7,000 units um, with a slightly a slight increase in operation costs, but all other costs of production being held constant. And what we've seen is a 50% um, profit margin in that second year. Great, okay. Sarah, over to you. Yes, hi, excellent presentation. I really liked how it was presented. And I see that your project has impacts on the social aspects of sustainability as well as the economic uh, aspect. But I'm having, I maybe don't understand very well your process of production. And did you think of any environmental impacts that could have, that the process itself has? I know that you're trying to solve the plastics problem and the pollution problem, but uh, the bleaching and all those steps, do they have any environmental impact? Okay, uh, well, thank you again for that question. Um, the model that we've used to design the production of the bag um, has been based on research that has uh, been done in a number of LMICs, including um, China and the Philippines. Um, and what we've actually seen is that um, the, the environmental impact of producing some of these materials is very low. Um, and especially for our product, which is going to be um, starting to be produced at a very small scale, um, there aren't a lot of um, chemicals that are used to digest um, those fibers that are found in the plant. Um, we are using um, 
uh, one sort of mineral salt um, that is, is going to digest some of those fibers to uh, smaller amounts of pulp. Um, but it's not something that um, has a, a very strong environmental impact. And um, the amount of benefit that we're actually getting from being able to convert this very abundant uh, local resource into something that can be produced on a large scale um, is, is something that we think is going to offset that cost. Um, and that, that's considering as well the benefit that this has for communities and, and making sure that production is actually coming from within um, a developing country instead of relying on imports from um, some of these uh, bigger Western powers um, that really just diverts a lot of economic power and um, uh, autonomy from these communities. Thank you. And Shiri, over to you. Thank you. Um, I was hoping you can touch on two things. One is tell us a little bit about your team and the team members and your background. Um, and the second question is about uh, the process itself. So uh, what's the origin of this technology? Is this your invention, somebody else's invention? Is it uh, registered anywhere? So um, I can answer the first, but thank you. So our team, um, what's unique about us is that not only do we have a team here in Canada made up of a lot of U of T alum and current students, but we actually have an implementation site. We have an implementation implementation team. And this is really important to us because you want to take a really decolonial approach. Um, oftentimes, right, uh, when you have NGOs, their entire team's here. There's no one on the ground, right? And that takes a lot of self-determination away, right? You can't do proper needs-based analysis when you do that. And so for us, our team not only is it made up of like medical students, people in uh, global policy and global affairs in global health, you know, we have grad students, master's students, undergrads as well. Um, but we also have people, an incredibly diverse and well-connected board of directors in Ghana itself, people who are connected with organizations like WUSC, who are like economics experts, um, people who are well-connected with local leaders, local farmers, and 75% of our team is women-led. And this was really important to us because um, the people we're looking to help and support the most are women, right? In addition to youth. Um, and then Salaha can answer the second part of the question for you. Thank you. Would you mind repeating that second part of your question actually? Yeah, so I was trying to understand what's the source of the technology. Is this something that's already been patented? Is this your process? And if it is, did you patent that? So this is actually not something that we've patented yet. Um, we have uh, seen some examples of banana fibers being used in production of um, other materials. There is a, uh, a lot of research that's going out of, about how we can use this in producing textiles and other paper products. This is the first um, product of its kind that's being introduced in Ghana. And it really is something that um, allows a lot of buy-in from people at different stages of production, whether that be allowing farmers um, from local communities around the area to be able to sell some of their stock to us. Um, and as well, um, women who are looking for employable skills to be able to gain access to vocational training through our programming. So it's, it's something that is new to Ghana and um, we haven't yet uh, secured a patent in the country. Yeah, the question is, can you use that pattern? Uh, that's definitely something that um, is an important next step for us and uh, something that we'll, you know, be looking into. Okay, thank you. Great. And the last question is over to you, Sue. Thank you. I have actually two areas again as well. I'm wondering if quickly if you can comment on the full life cycle of the product. You talked quite a bit about using materials that would be going to waste. I'm wondering uh, what happens for end of life, if there's any considerations for like composting, recycling, uh, if you're gonna, you're basically just shifting from plastic bag garbage to the paper bag garbage. So I'm wondering uh, where that's gonna end up. And if there's any also, if you're thinking about composting in facilities, if there's any restrictions um, for it actually being able to be digested. Um, and then the second area, if you can comment on partnerships. So you did talk about potential consumers, uh, 2 million, but do you have any partnerships or you know, existing customers for the 5,000 that you're planning to produce in your first year and, and thoughts for scaling that? Great, thank you um, very much, Sue, for that question. Um, so to speak on uh, the life cycle of the product. 
So for the banana fiber um, plant itself, it usually just goes to waste once the fruit is extracted and the stems are not in use. Um, so we are using the stems and the leaves for the production and the waste product from that is very bad biodegradable and we will be giving that back to the farmers um, to use as like compost um, or fertilizer and mulch for their farms um, for the period where um, it's left to recoup for the next planting season um, as well as the leaves from the banana fiber plants are uh, something that is used in um, Guinean food making. Um, they do cook a lot of their um, foods in like those leaves and boil them. So that's something that we can also use um, to make like the life circle of the plant sustainable. Um, with regards to partnerships, we have spoken to some local um, small businesses in Shai Osudoku area where we'll plan on doing um, majority of the production. And um, most of them have expressed interest in at least like testing out the products at their shops. Um, and then we'll look forward to expanding across um, the entire area and then possibly also going into the Accra market, which is like the capital city of Ghana. And there are more, um, a lot of like young millennials as well as um, immigrants from um, abroad who work there, who are very interested in sustainable products and wanting to maintain that lifestyle while living um, in the country. So that's our plan um, for you know the production as well as the partnerships. Great. Well, thank you to the entire uh, YARIC Foundation team. And this concludes the pitch competitions. So thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask the judges to leave the webinar and join a Zoom breakout room for their deliberations. And we will return. Uh, we're running a little ahead of schedule, but we'll return uh, uh, about 3.15 to announce the winners. And while the judges are deliberating, we will announce the recipients of the Sustainable Action Awards and the Adams Sustainability Faculty and Student Grants. I will now turn it over to Scott Hendershot to present the Sustainability Action Awards. Take it away, Scott. Thank you very much, Derek. And uh, thanks to everyone for their, their pitches. Really, really impressive stuff. Uh, I was really enjoying all, all, uh, all of those presentations. It was awesome. So I'm gonna jump right in to our Sustainable Action Awards, if I could. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Give me a second here, everybody. So give me a thumbs up if that looks good to everybody. Okay, perfect. Thank you, John. Okay, so um, jump over to my uh, to my picture. So thank you very much. The Sustainable Action Awards, everybody. We recognize individuals and teams who make tangible contributions to sustainability at U of T. The SAAs, as we're calling them now, by the way, they already have an acronym. Previously, were called the Green Ribbon Awards, which were last awarded back in 2019. So we've had a couple of year hiatus, COVID, et cetera. We're back to recognize outstanding contributions to campus sustainability. The winners will receive a $200 Visa gift card personally for themselves and the option to donate, not the option, but they will donate $100 to a charity of their choice. And just to give you some examples of some of the charities that the winners have chosen already, by the way, for example, we have, bear with me for a second as I pull up my documentation, uh, Doctors Without Borders, Sustainability Network, the Scott Mission just down the street, Light Up the World, Toronto Green Community, Freshwater Future Canada, UNICEF, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, just as a few of the examples. So we were really hoping to get this kind of uh, engagement with respect to the different selections of the charities. So we're really, really happy with that. That worked out so well. Um, the winner of the external uh, business or partner category, category will also be recognized with a trophy made from reclaimed wood from the Landmark Project. So the winners were chosen by a tri-campus tri panel. Nomination were scored on depth and breadth of contributions and on contributions across the social, economic, and environmental aspects of sustainability. So let's go on to our very first winner. So if she is around, she shall. Um, I'm going to go through if she could maybe uh, 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 bring her camera, turn her camera on for us. Uh, so this is under the student individual category, as you can see. Um, and uh, hey, G, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you. So she is studying her Master of Science in Sustainability Management. She is, she is philanthropic, passionate, hardworking, and a person filled with positive energy. She has dedicated her entire undergraduate and graduate studies at U of T towards developing the capacity building and implementation of the three pillars of sustainability. Her studies, research, internships, on-campus activities, and extracurricular activities all surround the theme of sustainability. That's a difficult thing to do. So congratulations. In 2021, she interned at the UN 
uh, program for five months, United Nations Environment Program, pardon me, for five months, reported to the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. While working at the United Nations, she helped draft the first version of the post-2020 biodiversity framework. She also helped with the Japan Bio Biodiversity Fund, uh, precisely the fund's effort to support and finance environmental protection and biodiversity restoration projects in developing countries. Recently, she has joined the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force, where she works as a youth consultant with youth representatives from all over the world to deliver on a policy paper on protecting the environment and nature. She also helps organize the UN Youth Environmental Assembly in Canada, where she shares and knowledge on environmental policies, climate change, biodiversity restoration, and Canadian youth. She has founded the Energy Network, last but not least, at the U of T to help bridge the knowledge gap between sustainable energy professionals and the U of T students. Hoping to create a platform for U of T students to network and learn from professionals working across a, to, and towards a zero net zero carbon future. She is also a pro bono consultant at the U of T Sustainability Consulting Group, where she uh, helps local businesses uh, and uh, set science-based targets, pardon me, to decarbonize and achieve their sustainability goals. So a big round of virtual applause for G. Thank you so much for your contributions. Very, very impressive. So maybe we can, uh, I think we're taking pictures in the background. So we see your picture. Thank you so much. And I would also like to, if everyone's aware, we do have runner-ups in this, in, for each of these awards too as well. Our runner-up in the student individual category was Anisha Hundel. So I'm not sure if she's with us or not, but thank you so much. Uh, she will be receiving her gifts off to the side. So thank you, Ji. We will move on to our next award, uh, which is going to Alice and Natapol. If they are available, please turn your cameras on for us. And I'll go through the description. So Alice and Natapol are PhD candidates in Italian studies. They're both passionate advocates of sustainability on a personal level and the broader U of T community. They are committed to inspire friends, colleagues, and family into a more sustainable lifestyle. On, on an everyday level, their mobility mostly relies on biking and public transportation. They also commit to reducing waste and consumption by prioritizing unpackaged food and bringing their own containers to stores and restaurants. As for their on-campus engagement, they do their best to promote environmentally mindful attitude amongst their colleagues. For example, not a pool, learned how to print on both sides of the page from an old printer that doesn't have such a function and instructed, instructed graduate students to do the same. On her side, Alice spearheaded the, induction, the introduction pardon me, of a reusable coffee cup initiative by providing ceramic espresso cups. Who doesn't like a good espresso in a sustainable fashion? Love it. This led to a significant decrease in the number of single use cups at the Department of Italian Studies. So Alice and Nanopol have been supporting each other on everyday sustainability for some time now. So it naturally came, uh, made sense for them to kind of team up as a student uh, group. And this also means join for, joining forces and planning some community outreach events for the members of their department on how to incorporate sustainability into everyday lives and durable habits. Alice has been a member of the UT trash team for a few months, and she recently took part in the waste audit program. She recalls this as a very enriching experience as she learned how to reduce waste production and recycle properly. One of her main points of interest is a combination of sustainability and inclusivity. Her plan for the immediate future involves gathering resources and evidence to, to people, to help people, pardon me, navigate sustainable alternatives in a very affordable way. And Natapool is a former vice chair of, UTSG, of UTGSU's Environmental Justice and Sustainability Committee, that's a mouthful, he is currently writing a dissertation on environmentalism in Italy and environmental consciousness written in the works of a 20th century Italian writer. The choice of this topic not only has academic relevance, but also fosters a constructive attitude in terms of sustainable development and inclusivity. Recently, he conducted a, North, uh, a talk at the Northrop Fry Center where he discussed the impact of positive environmental narratives in, in shaping people's understanding of environmental issues and suggesting solutions to these problems. So a big hand to Alice Natapol. Thank you so much for, for your submission and for all of your efforts. Wow, as all I can say, thank you so much. And if you could just kind of quickly pause, I think we have some pictures in the background. And then I would also like to congratulate our runner up uh, in this category, which is the Energy Network. So thank you very much, Alice and Natapol. We're gonna move now on to our uh, category of the faculty member individuals. So this is Hans. So Hans if, Hans, if you haven't turned your camera on already, perhaps you can. So as an architectural historian, there he is. Uh, critic, writer, and professor Hans Eblings has made an outstanding difference with the comprehensive pedagogy of sustainability. His multi-layered perspective through which his views and teaches architecture is remarkable. 
For the 2020-2021 academic year, he won the Adam Adams Sustainability Faculty Grant to transform his history courses for first year students at the Daniels faculty into a global warming history of modern architecture. Through the course, he incorporated a dozen projects, key projects of architects, which did not focus on the, the familiar culture values of these projects, but examine how they impact and respond to the environment, the ecology and the climate. Furthermore, students were introduced to several perspectives to view the diverse nature of architectural history. The course uh, touches upon the majority of the UN SDGs, influencing the minds of future architects to create sustainable cities through sustainable communities and vice versa. He is currently writing a book entitled Planet Planetary Warming of Modern Architecture, in which he aims to planetize architectural history. A recent roundtable discussion to be hosted with the Student Equity Alliance at the Daniels Faculty, Planetary Warming and Inequalities, encouraged the dialogue of inequality inequalities present in architecture, analyzing their nature, and challenging the student audience to share their ideas. The contributions mentioned above are not only are only a handful of examples from Professor Liebling's diverse and endless complex actions towards a more environmentally conscious future. Big round of applause, Hans. Thank you so, so much. Um, and I, I must say right off the bat, I apologize. We don't have a lot of time for people to, to provide comments, but uh, we just wanted to thank you so, so much for, for all of your contributions. And as well, I would like to say a big congratulations to the runner up in this particular category, which is James Poslens. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to our next award. And that is the employee group. And I'm very happy to announce the University of Toronto trash team, which is a team of many. I'll just list a few names. So we have Chelsea, Hannah, Raffaella, uh, Francesconi, Emily, uh, Shelby, and Susan, to name a few. It's a very large group, but, uh, but yet yeah, a very impressive group. I've met much, much of them, or many of them so far. So it was formed in 2017 in collaboration with the Rockman Lab and the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Their core mission is to create waste literacy in our community while reducing plastic pollution in our ecosystems. What started as a small team of less than 20 has now grown to 86 volunteers total in, in uh, 2021. So the trash team has three focus areas, outreach, education, and solutions-based research. Through community outreach, the team leads and engages in a variety of community events, including public talks, cleanups, and tabling events. Their most popular event, the annual Urban Litter Challenge, highlights our urban connections to watersheds and has removed greater than 50,000 pieces of litter from our environment, diverting it away from Lake Ontario. Their collection program includes a classroom visit program for grade five students. The university student volunteers co-created four waste literacy theme lesson plans and are trained to deliver to elementary school classes. Since the start of the program in 2020, the trash team has engaged 36 classrooms, 730 fifth grade students and trained over 26 student instructors at universities. Their solutions-based research program employs data-driven projects to reduce, to reduce plastic pollution. One stream of projects focuses on upstream solutions to different sources of plastic pollution. They also work downstream in collaboration with Ports Ontario and the TRCA. Their Fighting Floatables project includes local research and technology solutions uh, to prevent and clean up floating litter in our Toronto Harbor. Informed by science, the U of T trash team uses waste literacy to empower themselves and others to reduce pollution and ultimately inform a more sustainable Toronto and beyond. Let's give a big a virtual round of applause. There's too many of you to thank. Chelsea and team, thank you so, so much. Uh, and we're gonna hold you for a picture. Everyone take a picture, yeah. And then uh, I would also like to say a big congratulations to the runner up in this category, which is OISE's Sustainability and Climate Action Network. You, all these submissions made it very difficult for, uh, for the judges panel to, to, to do these judgings. Thank you so much, U of T Trash Team. And we're gonna move now on to our staff member, member individual uh, category and the winner is Bill Cole. And I think I've seen him earlier before. So Bill, if you could turn your camera back on if it isn't already. So a pilot project by Chief Horticulturalist Bill Cole to replace sodium lamps with LED panels in the greenhouses at U of T or Sciences Center has produced excellent results to reduce energy consumption in one of the greenhouse and one of these greenhouses as part of climate action. The Earth Sciences Growth Facilities contain 15 research glass houses and a four zone plant diversity collection with over 500 species native to desert, tropical and temperate environments. Some species require supplemental high intensity light to flourish. Researchers from the Departments of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology 
and cell and systems biology departments have used these facilities illuminated with soda and vapor lamps, but they are inefficient and are dominated by yellow light. The new LED lights will expand the list of possible species lengthen the growing season and save energy. Over the last few years, the changes have reduced electricity demand by 31 kilowatts and saved over 186,000 kilowatt hours per year since December 2019. And when we look at uh, direct energy savings from switching to LED, they're accompanied by a number of additional benefits. The color balance for the spectrum is uh, better for the plants, providing more red and blue wavelengths. The new lights also produce less radiant heat, which will also reduce the burning of cooling for the greenhouses themselves. Bill and his co-worker Te Tom Gudovach, I hope I have that correct, have recommended proceeding with full replacement in the remaining 14 greenhouse zones at the top of the Earth Sciences Center. So as the yellow glow above air sciences transitions to a more even hue, U of T will be reducing energy as part of climate action. Bill, thank you so much. Very impressive, very much appreciate your contributions. That is awesome. And we're gonna hold for a picture. Thank you so much. I don't think we actually have a runner up so to, to list for this one. So thank you, Bill, so much. And last but not least, we have our external business partner, uh, winner, and that is Regenesis Canada. So I'm not sure if we have Mike, Joda, or Naomi along with us. If they are, you can please turn your cameras on. Regenesis Canada has contributed enormously to sustainability at the University of Toronto. Through chapters at St. George, Mississauga, and Scarborough campuses, Regenesis has supported numerous University of Toronto students realize their environmental visions for sustainability events and initiatives. Examples of this include the creation of reuse centers on all three campuses, hosting tree plantings in a pollinator garden, that's at the Scarborough campus, and supporting Dig In campus uh, agriculture at St. George with fundraising, volunteer recruitment, event support, and communications. Regenesis Canada has helped raise tens of thousands of dollars to support University of Toronto's environmental initiatives and student jobs. Hundreds of U of T students have received placements or membership or mentorship from Genesis Canada, including students in the engineering program, sustainability management at UTM, biology at UTSC, and many, many, many more. Regenesis Canada has also been a community partnership multiple times with the Center for Community Partnerships. Regenesis Canada has a longstanding commitment to advancing sustainability at the University of Toronto and supporting the education and growth of the next generation of sustainability leaders. So let's a big round of applause. Naomi, thank you for being with us today. That's fantastic. Congratulations, that is absolutely awesome. And I just wanted to point out that uh, on the right-hand side here, I didn't talk a little bit at the start, but I'll take two minutes with respect to how we judged and, and this, this particular award itself. So for the external award here, Regenesis, we took a piece of, uh, of uh, a leftover lumber from our landmark project and created this, uh, this uh, piece of art for you, basically. So congratulations, this will be delivered to you very, very shortly. Uh, but it is a, a piece of the uh, University of Toronto uh, St. George campus in our thanks to you. So I think that is it uh, for me. I can switch it back over uh, to the team. John, I think it's over to you. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, oh. Really impressive list of activities. So congratulations to all those winners that well-deserved. and. It's just great to hear all of the exciting things that are going on and all the initiative that's being taken. Um, so I want to now move on to the Adams Sustainability Faculty Grant winners. Um, and at this time, I'll ask uh, the, the winners to turn on their video. Um, and I think Ellen will show us a slide. As part of the Adams Sustainability Celebration, three grants of $5,000 each were made available to U of T faculty members and instructors to add sustainability to their courses or curriculum. The objective was to design, develop, or enhance curriculum opportunities for U of T students to learn more about sustainability topics and challenges. Any faculty member or instructor committed to integrating sustainability principles and content into their coursework were welcome to apply. Priority was given to instructors of community engaged learning courses and campus as living lab courses. In other words, uh, courses that put students out into the practitioner community on campus, campus as living lab courses, or uh, outside uh, the university, uh, community engaged learning courses. Um, funding will be used towards changes in coursework offered in the summer of 2022, this coming summer, the fall or winter 2023 term. 
Uh, various applications were reviewed by the CECCS Secretariat and the winners selected in consultation with the CECS co-chairs, Ron supporting myself. Applications were evaluated based on the goal and vision of the applicant as outlined in their proposal. The first Adams Sustainability Faculty Grant winner is Professor Ting Ting Zhu at the Department of Geography, Geomatics and Environment and Department of Mathematical and Computational Sciences at UTM. Let's hear from Professor Zhu about her proposal. Over to you. Thank you, John. Um, so um, the project idea for this one um, is based on the uh, sustainable development that is a global and also an interdisciplinary uh, effort. So in this regard, um, in my discipline that I'm teaching, uh, the GIS uh, provides a holistic solution as, it's, uh, as it accounts for the spatial interactions and also integrates the multidisciplinary data to guide the informed decisions. So it is uh, very important to plant the sustainability concepts in the future GIS professionals. Um, and in this project, I choose to implement it in an experiential learning course, um, because uh, even if the practitioners are aware of the sustainability concepts, uh, they may face a lot of challenges in making decisions due to the trade-off um, trade-offs while implementing real-world projects. So the students in this experiential learning course uh, who participate in the real-world projects will read the literatures uh, on sustainability on a weekly basis. And we will design some guided questions. Um, so students will discuss about these concepts in the literature and how they connect to their project and then actively apply the sustainability design in the projects. Uh, so our goal is to develop a few modules, uh, which um, is carefully selecting the literature and also forming the discussion questions. Uh, eventually, I hope these uh, modules can be transferred to any experiential learning courses. Thank you, John. Thanks, Ting Ting, that's great. Uh, nice to see this integration of the kind of academic side and the and the applied side uh, built right into the curriculum of the course. Uh, so thanks very much and congratulations to you. The next faculty grant winner is uh, Professor Marianne Tushi, jointly appointed in civil and mineral engineering and mechanical industrial engineering. Uh, Professor Tushi unfortunately cannot be with us today. Uh, but you can take a moment to review her plans for this grant on the slide. Um, uh, the idea behind this project is uh, to build uh, living lab capability into uh, Marianne's existing undergraduate courses. Um, so uh, the development of mini labs in campus buildings for building science and heating, ventilation, air uh, conditioning fundamentals courses about 200, as you can see, about 200 students a year. So congratulations to Marianne uh, for that. Um, by the way, it would be kind of interesting perhaps to set up a discussion with Hans uh, Iblings, who's uh, won a, a different award, but also for, uh, for curriculum and teaching and sustainability. Uh, so there's a, a connection perhaps to be made there. Um, with our three Adams Sustainability Faculty Grant winners. Um, the third faculty grant winner is Dr. Hilary Inwood, a Sustainability Education Coordinator and Lecturer at uh, OISE. Uh, Hilary, please share a bit about your plan. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, this faculty uh, grant. I'm very excited and, and very appreciative to the CECCS as well as uh, Wendy Adams for making this possible. 
Uh, this was not a logical course to enter <laughs> into this, uh, this grant competition in that it already had a strong focus on sustainability. Um, I work at a place called the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. It is uh, U of T's Faculty of Education. And um, you know, there's been a heavy emphasis on this campus in the past in recognizing the role that we have to play um, in the, the sciences, for example, in moving towards sustainability. But I argue that education has an equally important role to play in helping to really move uh, Canadians and, and people around the world to living in more sustainable ways. Uh, education's got to be central to that undertaking. So uh, the course that I teach is um, uh, called Exploring the Praxis of Environmental and Sustainability Education. It already had a strong focus on environmental and sustainability education, but was taught in more traditional ways. So um, redesigning the pedagogy of this course was actually the focus of this grant application. Uh, I'm aiming to shift it towards a more transformative pedagogy that's student-centered, that's holistic, and that focuses on integrated learning. So not just based in the sciences, but taking it right across uh, the curriculum at the kindergarten to grade 12 level, uh, and also into the graduate courses that we do at, at OISE in education. Uh, certainly centering Indigenous knowledge and land-based learning will be an important part of this course. Um, and exploring the roles of education in sustainability and climate justice will also be centered in the work that we do. With the, uh, this is going to be very unusual for an education course. We don't have many courses at OISE that have a lot of field trips built in, but this, this uh, course is going to be one long extended field trip, if you will, uh, that really does center the city as classroom, learning about uh, nature in the city, learning about urban built environments, uh, and the intersections with sustainability and climate action and climate justice is part of that. So this is what we talk, call taking a place-based approach, really rooting the, the learning. And no big surprise that I've done this purposefully as we are climbing out of the pandemic, hopefully demonstrating that we can um, really take our learning outside, which we know to be safer at this point in time as the pandemic is still, still heading into its next, next wave. Um, I purposely chose this photograph, by the way, this aligns with the view of the top of OISE. So I'm hoping to bring these changes uh, throughout every level uh, at OISE uh, over time. And um, certainly we'll be taking both high levels and ground level views of uh, using the city as classroom as part of this course. One last thing is that I do give a menu of assignments and um, uh, having CEL, the community engaged learning, as well as CLL, campus is living lab assignments, will be part of this course and the students will be encouraged to take what they learn from the course and integrate them into their final assignments by working with schools and other community-based organizations to help further uh, environmental and sustainability education as part of their learning, uh, right directly related into the course. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks very much, Hillary. And thanks to all, all three. Um, I think there's really interesting things happening in pedagogy these days as we're learning new ways to teach and new ways to learn. Um, and I think you see that reflected in, in, in the three prize winners today. So congratulations to all of you. Um, Hillary, I just thought as you were speaking about uh, the work Jane Wolfe is doing that over, overlaps a little bit, uh, I think with what you're proposing, she's in Daniel. So it might be a, an interesting connection to make on place-based learning and field trips and well, and John, if I can put in a really quick plug for the community of practice that we're just starting to develop, right. to focus on transformative approaches to sustainability pedagogy. Um, there'll be more events coming up. We just started the spring. There'll be more events coming up, and I'm hoping that the work I do will help to feed into that community of practice for U of T faculty as well. Excellent. So we're, at some point, we're on the verge of transformation of the university. We're not quite there yet, but you know the, the momentum is building for some really fantastic uh, and fundamental shifts, I think, uh, in the way uh, we learn, teach, and research at the university. So I'll turn things back now to Ron to introduce our student grant winners. Thank you very much, John. It's, just, it's quite exciting to hear all about what's happening with our faculty grants and our sustainable action awards. And, and now we get to round that up by looking at some of our student grants. And you know, earlier on, right when we launched this celebration, we put a call for applications for the Adams Sustainability Student Grants. So current undergraduates or graduate students from any of our faculties or disciplines right across uh, U of T were invited to apply for one of these three grants of the $5,000. So we, we look for people with clean, keen interest, pardon me, in sustainability and a concrete plan as to how they'd advance sustainability on our campuses. Individuals or teams are considered for these grants based on uh, their demonstrated leadership and sustainability and also the following parameters. So 
but for the degree of innovation, originality, and commitment in their plan, the overall contribution that I think it have to sustainability on our campuses and how viable and sustainable the plan is. So with that in mind, uh, our first Adam Sustainability Student Grant winners are uh, Miriam and Nival Riemann on behalf of the uh, University of Toronto Sustainability Film Festival. So I believe both are, are here with us today and I'd like to invite them to tell us a bit more about their plan. Awesome, thank you so much for having us and for giving us this opportunity. We're really honored to be recipients of the award. And um, just to give you a little bit more background about our initiative, um, the U of T Sustainability Film Festival aims to use the power of storytelling to really raise awareness about sustainability on campus and encourage students as well as faculty members to get involved and take action in their own ways for the UN Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. Yeah, and over the next year, between May 2022 and March 2023, we're gonna aim to achieve this mission by hosting a short a student uh, film competition for short films um, and we're going to be organizing four fi virtual film events throughout the year as well and also a week-long film festival uh, as well towards the end of this year. Um, we're really excited to be working on this project in collaboration with several faculty and student members and just really excited to bring this to life and this wouldn't have been possible without the um, Adam Sustainability Grant so thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah and I think that like having like using storytelling in a way that advances sustainability sustainability is really important, especially because it brings people together. And we find that film as a, as a medium of raising awareness is something that we've always been really passionate about. And we're excited to give students the access to resources where they can create their own films, but also, you know, view films around this space as well. So we're really excited. And thank you so much again for this opportunity. Well, thank you both. I'm very excited to, to actually attend this film festival. So please uh, keep us in the loop and we'd love to get that schedule and information out. Uh, right across the university. Our, our second student grant winners are Sarah Gigi and Yao Yang Han from Regenesis UTSC for their UTSC Free Store Initiative. I believe they're here as well today. We'd love to hear more about, about this initiative. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah and uh, this is my partner Yao Yang and we are both members of Regenesis at U of T. Uh, UTSC Scarborough campus and Yayan is the president of Regenesis and I'm the financial director and we just want to start off by saying thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to speak about our project and plans for this year and we're very grateful and very fortunate to have received the sustainability grant award and um, that being said we'll just go over like a brief overview of our plans and we're planning to use this grant towards a free store on the UTSC campus. Uh, the free store, as its name says, is a store where everything in it is free. Uh, this concept was kind of taken um, from a model at York University, and we were able to actually visit the free store a couple months ago and see it in action. Well, thank you very much. Oh, oh sorry. So the free store is based off of four core concepts surrounding educational awareness, um, anti-consumption production, waste diversion, and providing student opportunities. Um, next slide, please. So the free store will be located in one of the residence buildings at UTSC, and we're currently working with residents to gain access in order to renovate the space and as well um, get volunteers and coordinators to run the store all year round. We're hoping to offer a paid work study position for students to help upkeep and maintain the store once it's fully functional. And items will be collected by direct donations from ETSC Lost and Found, residents and from staff and other local organizations. Next slide, please. So this is just a brief timeline. Um, we hope to finish renovations and collect donations starting May of this year and have a pop-up event during Frost Week during September. And by January or even as early as September, we hope to have our store up and running and promoting. And in the future, we hope to continue expansions towards having um, a boring center similar to the lobby where items can be borrowed or, um, and returned for things that people may not use um, frequently in their lives, but also still require it. So to conclude, we'd like to express our gratitude for this and thank you for having the opportunity to speak about our plans. Well, thank you very much and congratulations. 
Our third uh, student grant winners are Ayuni Ratnayak and Devlin Grenwald for uh, Parks Canada UTSC for their tree discovery walk. So looking forward to hearing more about, about this. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ron. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ayuni, and uh, I'm here with my colleague Devlin from the UTSC Parts Canada Club. Um, and we are extremely honored and exciting, uh, excited to be receiving this grant for our project. Um, and so just a little bit about um, our club. We are an environmental and outdoor recreational student group here at UTSC. Um, and we really aim to facilitate community connection and interaction with the local green spaces in around uh, campus. Um, and we know that sometimes uh, it's easy to feel a little disconnected with our outdoor and natural uh, environments, partially due to the fragmented nature um, of these green spaces around the GTA, and partially due to the sometimes sedentary lifestyles we tend to lead, um, especially in the context of a pandemic. Um, and so in kind of thinking about ways to navigate this issue, um, we developed the Tree Discovery Walk. Um, and so in a nutshell, the idea is to create an interactive walk through the UTSC Valley Trail, um, where QR code decorated botanical signs would be used to highlight various tree species that hold uh, ecological, cultural, and research significance. And specifically, the walk uh, would aim to host uh, approximately 25 tree stations at various locations along the Valley Trail. Um, and we, host, uh, we hope to host background information, both audio um, and text information about these various tree species um, on the UTSC Biological Science, uh, Sciences webpage um, that would be accessible via the QR codes um, as people walk through the trail. Um, and we hope to curate and uh, research all of this information with a team of dedicated undergraduate students um, over the summer and hopefully uh, get it running uh, for the fall. And um, ultimately, we hope that this walk is able to facilitate a deeper connection and understanding with at least one of the uh, beautiful green spaces near us um, for both the UTSC and uh, local community as well. Um, and in the long run, just uh, hopefully nurture both physical and mental well-being overall. Thank you. Congratulations to, to all of our, our grant winners today. And I understand that uh, our judges are back from our challenge, and, and I will turn it over to Derek uh, to introduce. Thank you, Ron. We are back. I hope everyone enjoyed seeing the Sustainable Action Award winners, as well as hearing from the Adams Sustainability faculty and student grant recipients. Now, for the Innovation Prize results. First off, it was wonderful to see the passion and enthusiasm of the competitors when they pitched their ideas. U of T students are among the most innovative in the world, and that was superbly demonstrated during this competition. Before we announce the winner, I'd like to again thank our esteeming, our esteemed judging panel once again. So my sincere thanks to Professor Ken Kortz, Sue Talusin, Yvette Vera Perez, Professor Sarah Turkey El Idrissi, and Professor Shiri Bresnes. We've deliberated for the last little while, and we have agreed on the winners. To summarize, there are three $1,000 prizes for the runner-up teams. Then the third place will be awarded $5,000, the second place with $7,500, and then our grand prize first place with $10,000. So first off, I will announce the three $1,000 prizes for the runner-up teams. And here they are alphabetically. And they're going to be on the next slide. Reaper, BioBlends, and Lente. Congratulations for being one of our finalists. And thank you so much for your participation. Congratulations. On to the top three prizes. Now, we'll, I'll announce the winners and we'll invite the team to turn on their camera and say a few, uh, a few words. Now, the third prize, the $5,000 is awarded to, I love the suspense, the Yari C Youth Foundation. I'll invite the team to turn on their cameras and make a few comments.
I'm just going to wait a few minutes for some of my other team members to come up. Um, uh, we have Marwa, we have Bumi, and we have Maram. And um, I wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to um, present our work at this uh, conference. Um, we came here last year, we won $1,000. Over the course of the past year, we've done a lot to expand our work. We've secured over 18,000 in grants, and we're so grateful for the mentorship and uh, the feedback that we've gotten today, and so tremendously grateful for the, the funds. Um, and we'll keep you updated on how that's spent. Thank you for believing in what we do and uh, for um, believing in an idea of sustainability that really uh, decolonizes, indigenizes and empowers local communities. I think that's really the heart of our work. So thank you. Well, congratulations, we're all cheering for you. We look forward to updates. Thank you to the whole team and congratulations. Now to our second place winners. And the suspense, second place, $7,500 goes to? Oh, we're having a little technical challenge. As we're waiting, the second place prize goes to Arbor. And so we'll get that slide up. And as we're getting the slide up, I'll ask the team to turn their cameras on and they can say a few words. Wow, thank you so much from Christina and I. We just want to thank everybody for their support and the judges for um, their, their questions and their feedback. Um, this is so exciting for us and we're so grateful for this opportunity. Um, I'll pass it on to Christina if she wants to add anything. Um, yeah, I just want to echo everything um, Stephanie said. Um, we really appreciate um, having this platform to share ideas and also um, having the opportunity to listen to the other team's um, ideas and getting to see all of the great innovation happening um, at U of T. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Congratulations again. And now if we were there would be a drum roll, the grand prize, first place winner. $10,000 and our winner is, and a special thanks for our very generous donor, Wendy Adams, Meal Care. Congratulations, Meal Care. Thank you so much. Um, I guess, first of all, I want to thank the Adams Sustainability Innovation Prize and the entire UFT kind of ecosystem that they've created, as well as all the hardworking members at Meal Care. We have two of them here on the call who are starting Meal Care at Toronto, actually. Um, and then Tamara, I don't know if they give a wave or something, but honestly, like $10,000 is a significant amount of money. And we hope to utilize that fund to create more chapters across Canada and once again, make the food system way more sustainable. Thank you. Congratulations. And again, congratulations to all the finalists for the sustainability and impact work that you do. This concludes the innovation competition. So I'll pass it back to Ron, who will close out the event. Congratulations once again to all of our winners today. There has been some absolutely exciting projects and ideas, and I couldn't be more excited about where sustainability is heading at U of T. Special thank you as well to Derek for, for your wonderful facilitation of these, uh, these awards and that prize. I wanted to remind everyone that uh, Adam's Sustainability Celebration is going to continue. There's two more panels, one on April 6th and one on April 9th. We're going to put the, that website uh, in the chat today and invite everybody uh, to join us there. On April 6th uh, at 11 o'clock till noon, we'll be exploring about creating a community of practice on sustainability across University of Toronto campuses. We have an opportunity to hear from a panel of faculty members involved in facilitating U of T's new community of practice on sustainability. They'll be sharing the community of practices plans and initial steps to engage faculty in collaboratively deepening their sustainability practices and their courses, the pedagogy and the programs. Our final event is on Saturday, April 9th from 10 a.m. to 1130. This is hosted by the Sustainable Engineers Association. This is a student organized panel on the role of youth in sustainability. This student initiated panel discussion will address ways to empower youth 
and involve them in sustainable engineering communities and talk about strategies to address gaps in the education system to promote green jobs. Two very exciting uh, discussions and, and events, and you won't want to miss them. The Adams Sustainability Celebration has been a wonderful success and has really shown you what the university is doing to advance the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and more generally about advancing sustainability at our university. I want to take a moment to, to, to recognize and really thank our donor, Wendy Adams, who's joined us today. Uh, really, without, uh, without her support, we couldn't have made this. That's a successful event and a successful year. So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing everybody at the celebration uh, next year. If you have any ideas about future panels uh, for discussion topics, if you want to host an event related to sustainability to help celebrate, or if you have any feedback, uh, please email us. We're going to put uh, the CECCS's website in the chat, and we welcome all of that feedback in terms of how we can improve this event and make an even greater and better sustainability next year, no, celebration next year. So thank you all for coming. Congratulations once again to all of our winners today. And we look forward to following up with them and hearing all about their outcomes and their exciting progress in the years to come. Take care and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.